Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's event. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Richmond Public Library is located on the ancestral territory of the Humcomunum speaking peoples. Welcome to a nourishing talk with award winning author Jane Wong. I'm Ginny Dunnell, Community Services Librarian, and on behalf of the Richmond Public Library, the Richmond Art Gallery Association, and Richmond Has Heart, I'd like to welcome you to today's program. In a few moments, we will welcome our special guest, Jane Wong, for a presentation and interview with our own Michelle Callahan, Head of Adult and Senior Services at Richmond Public Library. We have an exciting hour ahead of us. First, Jane will join us for a presentation, and then we want to hear from you. Please send in your questions as they come up, and we will begin the interview portion of the event with some of your questions. Then Michelle and Jane will chat a little bit about Jane's background, writing, food, and more. Today's program emerges from the Nourish exhibition, currently on display at Richmond Art Gallery in partnership with Richmond Has Heart. We will now hear from Kathy Tycholis, Education and Public Programs Coordinator at the Richmond Art Gallery, to tell us about the exhibition and how today's program came to be. Thanks, Ginny, and hello to everybody out there. Thank you for joining us all tonight, and welcome to everybody on the panel. Um, so I'm here just to give a little bit of background on the exhibition that's uh, currently at the Richmond Art Gallery, and that brought Jane Wong to Richmond and to our session tonight. So um, Nourish is uh, the current exhibition that opened January 22nd and continues until April 3rd, 2022. Uh, the exhibition is curated by uh, Nan Capona um, and it features the work of American poet and writer Jane Wong as well as an animated installation uh, by Metro Vancouver based duo uh, Mizonk, otherwise known as Wan Yilin and Roger Chen. And shown together, the exhibition offers insights into ideas around nourishment and care, uh, with each artist addressing this theme in their own way. And our guest tonight, Jane Wong, is known more for her poetry, so it was really interesting for us to work with a poet in a visual art setting. Um, and the works you will see um, in the gallery actually came to us after our curator, Nan, she saw the exhibition uh, that Jane held in 2019 at the Fry Art Museum in Seattle. And she thought it would work really well in the Richmond Art Gallery and for the Richmond community. So here's a shot of the installation at the Fry Museum. Um, this was her first solo exhibition and it came about as an award she won for her writing in 2017 where the winners get the opportunity to do something at the Fry. Um, so Jane worked with the staff at the Fry Art Museum to develop uh, her first solo exhibition. Uh, so our curator Nan Capona saw it, wanted to bring it to Richmond. So we've taken some components of this installation and also adapted it for our space. Um, and Jane, of course, also created some new work just for us. So here's kind of an overview shot install of the current show. Um, after preparing the altar, the ghosts feast feverishly. Um, so it features an oversized round dining table and that holds bowls containing fragments of the poem of the same name as the title. Um, our version is slightly smaller in size and includes a new chandelier uh, of six spoons. And here's an image of the bowls quotes up. So you can read the poem by walking around the table. Um, however, you know, unlike poetry that in a book, you can enter and exit at any point. So the poem would change for each visitor that comes in. Um, other works in the installation, um, this is just beside uh, the table there. It is a video of, of Jane reading The Long Labors. Um, and beside there is a shelf containing some scallions. Uh, so the video sh it is of Jane reading aloud the poem. Um, as well as she is not looking down at her hands, which impresses everybody, because she is just so masterfully making dumplings without even looking at her hands um, through as, as she recites the poem. And just to the right of this is another installation, uh, How Not to Be Afraid of Everything, um, which shares the same name of her recent book of poetry that came out in 2021. Uh, so an excerpt from the poem is printed on a long sheet of paper 
that is hanging on the space where we where the gallery stairs are and at the bottom of the stairs are some rice bags. So the bags were sourced from various local restaurants um, as well as thank you to Jane's mom who sent some rice bags and they are stuffed to appear as pillows uh, which is a nod to Jane's memories of sleeping on rice bags when she was a child in her, in her parents' family restaurant. Um, I will let Jane talk more about the themes and the ideas in her work. Um, so I won't really go on too much more. Uh, but as this exhibition was based on poetry, we reached out to the Richmond Library to make this author talk happen. Um, we really hope to expand sort of the usual visual art audience that the Richmond Art Gallery might have with the reading and writing audiences that the public library has. Um, so all our viewers might experience writing and visual art in a different way. Um, so I want to thank you to Ginny and Michelle for making this talk happen to Jane Wong for being such a gracious artist to work with. It's been a real pleasure working with you over this term of the exhibition. Um, and I will now pass, pass the mic on to Michelle who will lead the conversation with Jane. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy, and a big welcome to everyone. So I have the pleasure now, I get to introduce Jane Wong to you all. Um, so Jane is the author of the poetry collections, How to Not Be Afraid of Everything and Over Poor. Um, Jane holds a Master of Fine Arts in Poetry, a PhD in English, and is a, an Associate Professor of Creative Writing at Western Washington University. So Jane, welcome. We're just absolutely delighted to have you here with us today. Hi, everyone. It's such an honor to be here. I'm so, oh my gosh, I wish I was in Richmond. I know the show is closing soon, which I can't believe it's it's been such a wonderful run. So um, <clears throat> thank you everyone for being here. Um, thank you to the Richmond Art Gallery, of course, and um, Kathy also for that wonderful introduction and also the Richmond Public Library. Also, I just absolutely love that the gallery is right next to the library. It just feels like the perfect um, coupling as well. And thank you, Michelle and Ginny so much uh, also for your introductions. Um, my mom's name is Jin. Uh, so there's some, I was like, Ginny, Jin, oh, it's very kind of sweet, um, spelled with a J, J-I-N. Um, but yeah, I'm thrilled to, to have a conversation with you all. And um, I have my book here. Um, and so I'll be reading some poems from it too during the presentation. Um, <clears throat> this is my second book of poems and uh, it came out in October. So it's been a, a whirlwind uh, of a time. I still can't believe that this book is out there in the world. It's such a vulnerable one. So I just appreciate everyone's listening as I share poems and talk a little bit about the exhibit. Um, I'm going to go ahead and screen share um, for you all. And my apologies if you hear my dog chewing in the background. Um, I'm on dog duty, so 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 be it. He's he's super adorable, but uh, not a big fan of Zoom. I will say for sure. More Zoomies, less Zoom for Panko, my dog. Um, but I just wanted to start off um, with this image, actually of my mom and me at the Chinese American restaurant that I grew up in um, on the Jersey Shore. Um, I, again, grew up in a Chinese American restaurant um, in a strip mall. Uh, there was a pizzeria next door. There was also Burlington Co. Factory, a party store, a, a laundromat. Um, and um, unfortunately, the restaurant did not survive. Um, my father was actually, uh, you know, a how do I say it like a well it's I mean he was a gambler um <laughs> he pretty much gambled the restaurant away and so after that happens my mom actually decides to get rid of all of the photographs from the restaurant and this is the one surviving photo um which I find very very tender I think that she has decided to to keep that as the kind of like one photo um I kind of wanted to open up by by reading a poem actually uh, about kind of uh you know growing up in in the restaurant or at least a a hint of it um and this comes from a poem uh that is called uh, Dream of the Lopsided Crown. So I'll just read a little excerpt of that. <clears throat> dream of the Lopsided Crown. I have this dream where I am the daughter of the machinist. My father balancing pipes that lead to other pipes, dropping a marble ball. 
Precision as love without remainders, without the toothy excess of spiral bound notebooks, I cut love clean. Instead, I'm the daughter of the gambler who's winning the staring contest. I asked my father, I dare you to blink. Slump slug, he spills all the chips on the table and says nothing, always nothing. Chirp, chirp goes the robin, robber of dreams. All around me, Atlantic City butters itself with dinner rolls, rolls, roiling ocean bilge. No one looks me in the eye. Here is the daughter, spun in boardwalk cotton candy, puke perfect. Here is the father saying, I am your father. Village after village, fish bongers walk away from their fish drawn to city stupor dream of the dung beetle i soothe of its celestial turns simple machinations and muck rats seethe in alleyway walls where winter cannot fall down sooner my brother born in the blue flame of february is my mirror kin together we kick everything in sight to see better ant hill msg bin box of plastic cutlery clanging a xylent phone avant-garde we raise seashells to our ears and hear nothing <clears throat> but garbage trucks lifting all that we waste but want crush crap the dinosaur of garbage gobbles together the restaurant babies refill napkin and sauce containers like regurgitating bird food we sing of duck sauce and chili and straws pulled down by levers levitating in tubular innovation customers furnish their mouths with lacquered loins a pork procession dream of the country that shall not be named coins and clouds held over our heads like carrots. I have this term that I, I like to call us restaurant babies in particular. Um, kind of the kids are always at the restaurant, um, kind of like, you know, bored, tinkering with things, causing trouble, um, <laughs> also doing chores, um, just kind of a, a funny way to kind of grow up and such an influence on my poetry and art. Here's another image of me and my brother. Um, this is actually from New York City's Chinatown. And again, kind of thinking about the ways that I grew up is so central to a lot of my, my artwork. Um, the piece that um, Kathy showed you, which I'll show you again um, with the pillows, um, is really kind of centered on that kind of childhood dream quality, I think, especially not knowing fully the, the labor of my parents, kind of being at the restaurant at all times, but not understanding what was the kind of um, the daily lives that my parents were living through as they were trying to make ends meet for us. Um, and this kind of, again, leads um, into the art. <laughs> um, the show is really, um, the, the show at Nourish is really focused on that kind of, um, I guess that huge difference, that like, like that huge um, gap between gluttony and hunger. Um, and I, again, I grew up in a Chinese American restaurant, um, but I also come from a history of um, hunger um, and poverty and, and, and also starvation during the Great Leap Forward. And, you know, that was during my grandparents' generation, the Great Leap Forward, 1958 to 1962, <clears throat> led to uh, an estimated 36 million deaths. And I think about that history of what it means to come from a history of, of hunger. Um, and also my mother kind of growing up in those conditions. Um, and also just one, you know, a few generations later, what it means for me um, as uh, someone who's American born um, in a restaurant to be surrounded by food. And so uh, as Kathy was saying, the central table here um, to the show is this guy gigantic, almost like, I would call it like almost like a chocolate foil. It was like a gigantic, uh, yeah, like a, I don't know, I like to think of it as a, something so opulent, um, despite the kind of difficult subject matter that's at hand here. And as uh, Kathy mentioned, the poem actually exists within the bowls. And so you do actually have to walk around the table. It does not have a beginning or end. There are also empty bowls as well. Um, thinking about, again, that difference between the gluttony that I was raised in, but also the hunger that I come from. And I'll shortly read this poem to you all. Um, but I also love the chandelier. I love it, calling it a chandelier as well. Um, of soup spoons, almost as if the soup, the soup spoons are going to dip right into the bowls. And you can almost hear the clanging of the, the spoons, right? Kind of that, that kind of mm, clinging sounds, right? Clinking sounds. Um, and also I love the shadows that are <coughs> in the show as well. 
Uh, my apologies. I am uh, unfortunately kind of still, uh, uh, I, I recently unfortunately had COVID um, and uh, long story, but I'm negative, but it had definitely had some after effects. So I'm trying my best here. <clears throat> so thank you for your patience um, as I kind of regain my voice. Um, I also will uh, mention too that this particular um, slide here with the pillows does come from the, the title poem um, of my collection. And again, speaks to that sense of um, childhood, um, I guess like awe of my parents and understanding that their labor was so heavy. And you think about rice bags being so heavy, um, so full of that weight. And I really wanted to lift it up, make those pillows, fill it with air to kind of loosen that, that weight um, from history. And think about that kind of um, labor as something I wanna give my mother that kind of looseness um, kind of thinking forward. And the last kind of piece that's in the show currently at Richmond is this poem that I do actually cook and eat my, my own poem. So uh, one thing that Kathy didn't mention is that I actually uh, take lines from my poetry and I cut them out of rice paper. Um, and in the rice paper, um, those words, I actually fold them into the dumpling mix. And so when anyone's worked with rice paper, what happens is that it starts to disintegrate into um, anything that that's like liquid or wet. <clears throat> and I actually fold in those words from my poem. Uh, again, um, as Kathy mentioned, um, kind of be a muscle memory because that's what that was my biggest chore as a child when I was growing up in the restaurant was to fold those dumplings. Um, and then I cooked and ate my poem. So what the video doesn't show is me actually eating them, which I wish, I, I guess I should have included it, but uh, I figured like, uh, who wants to watch me like shove food in my mouth, but maybe that was meant to be actually. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and read some poems for you all. Um, and hopefully we can all chat and um, have some great open conversation. Um, and let me go back to this one here. <clears throat> So uh, this poem is entitled, After Preparing the Altar, the Ghost Feast Feverishly. In much of my book, How to Not Be Afraid of Everything, the poems in this book uh, are, are an attempt to speak to my ancestors um, who unfortunately did not survive the Great Leap Forward. Um, my grandfather was orphaned um, and <clears throat> was adopted by a family, uh, a man who also his family was uh, orphaned. And so even thinking about his family members that did not survive, I was writing these letters directly to my family members. Um, and in writing my letters directly to my family members, you know, if there's this kind of longing to hear back from them. Um, and actually they do, they, they do answer me. Um, and that's kind of like the magic, I think, of this poem. Um, so again, this poem is in the bowls uh, at the, at the, uh, at the um, Richmond Art Gallery. <clears throat> and this poem is called, After Preparing the Altar, the Ghost Feast Feverishly. How hard it is to sleep in the middle of a life, Audrey Lord. We wake in the middle of a life hungry. We smear durian along our mouths, sing soft death a lullaby, carcass breath, arrows of licked fingers and the finest perfume. What is love if not rot? We wear the fruit's hull as a spiked crown grinning in green armor. Death to the grub fat in his milky shuffle. Death to the lawlessness of dirt. Death to mud and all its false chocolate. To the bloated sun we want to slice open and yoke all over the village. We want a sun-drenched slug feast. An omelet loosening its folds like hot jello. We want the marble fat of steak and all its swirling pink galaxies. We want the drool, the gnash, the pluck of each corn kernel raw and summer swell. Tears welling up oil. Order up pickled cucumbers piled like logs for a fire, like fat limbs we pepper and succulent in. Order up shrimp chips curling in a porcelain bowl like subway seats. Grapes peeled from bitter bark, almost translucent, like eyes we would rather see. Little girl, what do you leave leaven in your sight? Death to the open eyes of the dying. Here, there's so many open eyes. We can't close each one. No, we did not stay the steamed eye of a fish. No eyelids fluttering about like no butterfly wings, no purple yam lips. We said eyes, still and resolute as a heartbreaker. Does this break your heart? Look, 
We don't want to be rude, but we want seconds, please. We want globes of oranges swallowed whole like a basketball, or Mars, or whatever planet is the most delicious. Slather Saturn, ferment Mercury, lap up its film of dust. We want seconds, thirds, fourths, meat wool, meat wool, a bouquet of chicken feet, a garden of melons monstrous in their bulge, prune back nothing, purr in this garden. We comb through berries and come out so blue. Little girl, lasso tofu, the rope slicing its belly, Clean. Deep fry a cloud so it tastes like bitter gourd or your father, leaving the exhaust of his car, charred. Serenade a snake and slither its tongue into yours and bite. Love, what is love if not knotted in garlic? Child, we move through graves like eels, delicious with our heads first, our mouths agape, our teeth, little needles to stitch a factory of everything made in China. You ask, are you hungry? Hunger eats through the air like ozone. You ask, what does it mean to be rootless? Roots are good to use as toothpicks. You, how can you wake up in the middle of a life? We shut and open our eyes like the sun shining on tossed pennies in a forgotten well. Bald copper and blood, you choy bolts into roses down here. While you were sleeping, we woke to the old leaves of your backyard shed and then we ate that. And then we ate one of your lost flip flops too. In the future life, we saw rats overtake a supermarket with so much milk, we turned opaque. We wake to something boiling. We wake to wash dirt from lettuce to blossom into your face, aphids along the lashes. Little girl, don't forget to take care of the chickens squawking in their mess and stench. Did our mouths buckle at the sight of you devouring slice after slice of pizza in the greasy box too? Does this frontier swoon for you? It's time to wake up. Wake the tapeworm who loves his home. Wake the ants. Let them do -si do a spoonful of peanut butter. Tell us, little girl, are you hungry, awake, astonished enough? Um, I'm just going to pause there. Um, stop share. And I just want to read one last poem. And um, I'm excited to have our conversation together. <laughs> um, this one poem, actually, I hope you can all see on the screen. It's kind of in this form. It's a pretty short poem, um, but I like to read it kind of all directions. It doesn't have necessarily a beginning or end as well. And this poem is called An Altar. A glass of water half full with my lipstick along the edge to keep you afloat, to let you know I kissed it first. Along the edge to let you know, to keep you afloat, full of my lipstick, a glass of water, half to let you know I kissed it first to keep you afloat. Thank you, everyone. And I'm excited to have lots of conversation. Um, Thanks, and I'm happy to read in conversation and um, other excerpts as well. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you, it was beautiful. And it, it seems that we have some questions coming in on our Q&A, yeah. we'd love, love, thank you audience members for sending in your questions. Um, so if it's okay with you, Jane, we'll just dive right into some of the- Yeah, I can't wait. Um, and thank you for reading your poems. Oh, it's of course. So special to hear it from you. Now we have a question about uh, two favorites. Uh, there's a question, what is your favorite um, part of being a writer? Oh, I absolutely love this question. You know, my very favorite part of being a writer, unsurprisingly, um, is writing. Um, I know that seems kind of obvious, but to be honest, um, especially as like uh, this book came out and you know I'm reading and, and performing, which I love performing and I love also, you know, getting to, to kind of have the opportunity to have a book, you know, and to, to share from it. Um, that aspect of being a writer is not really actually part of the creative process. Um, and I think that I have to, I have to get used to that actually over the years, I've been trying to get used to what does it mean to publish a book? What does it mean to, <coughs> to share it? Mm -hmm. And a lot of it comes back down to those moments when you're creating and you're dreaming of things. Um, sometimes uh, in that creative spark, I feel like that the moment when you feel like you have a line of poetry or when you have an idea, like the very beginning seeds of an idea of writing, that's what I love. That's what, that's like the ideal part of writing. Thank you so much for that, that, that question. 
Thank you. I love that question. <laughs> and I, I'm sure asking different people, do you think the answers would vary from person to person, yeah. poet to poet, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now I'm going to go on to another favorite because I love this one and I'd love to hear your response on this. Yeah. Um, what was your favorite recipe or what is your favorite recipe from growing up? Ooh, uh, oh my gosh. Uh, so um, what's really interesting, I think when you grow up in a restaurant, you know, and again, growing up uh, in particular, low income and working class, and I'm the first in my family to go to college um, and also to finish high school. Um, but I think the biggest thing that, you know, I kept hearing from my parents was, you know, get out of the kitchen or kind of, uh, we don't want you to cook. We don't want you to be, um, you know, oh, which is funny because they also made me do the chores. So I was like, wait a second, you're telling me not to cook, but then I have to prep everything, you know, whatever. I mean, I guess you just do what your parents have to tell you, like they, they, what they tell you in those moments. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I didn't actually learn how to cook, like really cook my dog. Is <laughs> I'm just going to move a little bit. <laughs> um, um, I didn't actually learn to cook until the pandemic, actually. And really? I find that, yes. So only within the last few years, I didn't okay. even learn because I never, I could cook basic things like eggs, et cetera, um, pasta, but I never actually learned to cook uh, Cantonese or Toysanese food until the pandemic. And so uh, honestly, my favorite recipe, or I guess the thing that I really love to cook the most, um, I've been making um, homemade uh, bao from scratch, um, like chasu bao from scratch. It's so labor intensive to make the dough, to make the filling, to steaming it. Um, but there's something about it that the kind of, kind of the comfort level there is, you know, to kind of right. making that dish in particular and making it from start to finish, um, which to be honest, my mom would never do. She was like, that's too labor intensive. Mm -hmm. Like she was a working mom. She was like, no, I can't do that. Um, so I had to actually uh, gather that information from my grandmother, who's the one who makes the, the bow. Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. May I ask just a follow up to that? Was it, a, was it about finding comfort in food or time or connecting with, you know, just, or was it multiple things that sort of led to that, you know? Yes, absolutely. So it was totally comfort. It was, okay. um, to be honest, during the pandemic, I, I write a lot, um, speaking back to that kind of uh, what I love being about being a writer, is that creative energy. Um, I write a lot. Um, however, during the pandemic, especially the early days, I literally could not write a thing. And it was the okay. first time in my life since I was probably, I don't know, 10 years old, that I couldn't write. Like I felt literally paralyzed in mm -hmm. writing. This was my whole life. I, I had, mm -hmm. you know, it's like one thing that has gotten me through some really difficult times. And yet here was a difficult time. And I literally couldn't write a word. Um, I couldn't read even. Um, it was really difficult. Um, and so I was like, I had to do something. And so what I ended up doing was cooking. And to me, I kept telling myself, this soup is a poem. And I, I do believe that like this, whatever I'm making, if I'm making joke, you know, I'm making a poem. And so nowadays I think about that, like, you know, poetry is comfort, food is comfort, like all these acts of love. And that's ultimately what it is. But I needed that during the pandemic. I could not write. I'm finally coming back to writing, but okay. it took a long time. <laughs> um, so for anyone out there who like, was having difficulty creating or is still having difficulty creating, uh, these are really, really kind of difficult circumstances mm -hmm. still, you know? So thank you. I love that you added that. Cause I was like, I need, it was such a <laughs> uh, pivotal moment that I was like, I can't believe I can't write, but I can cook since when, you know, it's like, I woke up and suddenly I, 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 I what you're like, doing. Yeah. Yeah. It was like almost like in my blood, if that makes okay. sense. It does. Absolutely. And um, there's a question that's come in from one of our lovely audience members. Um, they're, they're saying that they're curious about um, what are some of the ways that you connect to your ancestors? Ooh, I love that mm. question. Hmm. You know, I think that one kind of, you know, direct thing that I do really truly is connect through poetry. And I, I, okay. I think what's really, um, hard for me is that, you know, I, I can give them like, you know, go to their grave sites and 
give them flowers and, and kind of give, you know, eat food on, you know, where, where we usually have grave souping day where we, we kind of celebrate our ancestors. Um, <clears throat> but unfortunately, like, to me, it's like, it's a kind of like a only, um, it's, it's like a surface level communication it's saying, saying, I remember you, I'm there. I needed, I needed to have a deeper mode of communication with my ancestors. Like I, I wanted to ask them questions. I wanted to deeply respect the stories um, that I don't really know. And it's really hard, I think, when you can't actually know. Um, I, I've been struggling with this, especially writing this book is like, what does it mean for all of you who are writers who are trying to look at your family's past, like a few generations back or even further, um, when you don't actually have full stories, you only have tiny fragments, tiny little passed down memories. Mm -hmm. How do you weave them into something that's fuller, right? Um, and so for me, poetry is a means of honoring them. Um, that said, these are in English. And I, I, I struggle with that a lot, that I so badly, and if anyone's a translator out there, I would love that opportunity. I'm unfortunately not fluent um, and, and able to write in Chinese. And so I think that's kind of an ultimate dream of mine is to either finally be fluent and be able to write in mm -hmm. Chinese um, or to, to have work with a translator and because I feel like I want to directly talk to them in their that language great. yeah that would be tremendous yes one day <laughs> one day there's a, a question that has come in and it's related ah. to um, how had we had been talking about or you had spoken about your pause in creativity during the pandemic yes. and the writing and the question coming in from our audience member is um, if your pause from writing during the pandemic changed the rhythm or pace of your poetry now, and have you noticed if your process or approach to, to writing has changed, actually? That's a really uh, thoughtful question. And, you know, to be honest, it, it deeply has. Um, I think we can all say the pandemic has changed us hmm. in ways that I guess are we're still processing like we don't really fully know the the amount of grief truly deeply personal and collective grief that we are kind of moving through um and on the daily right kind of like this affects us down to the tiniest things right um including um which is not a tiny thing for me which is poetry mm -hmm. um it has forced me to really really slow down I think that um, before I felt almost kind of like poetry felt like it was a, a rush, like there was always these things that are just trying to get out of me, almost kind of like, I don't know, like a cocoon, like a butterfly. I felt like my poems were like rushing to be like burst out of the cocoon. And now I think my process is much slower. It's it's kind of almost like a hibernating bear. Like I feel very kind of like it's just sitting there. Sometimes, honestly, when I still have trouble writing, I will not literally write down words, but I will just um, kind of sit there and meditate. And in my meditation, what happens is that a line of poetry will arise or I don't need to physically write in order to write. Like, I know that sounds bizarre, mm -hmm. um, but I think that I felt like the pressure, like, you know, I'm gonna sit at my table and I'm gonna write a poem. Like, I don't do that anymore. I can't do that anymore. So I, I feel like I have to be more in my body um, during the pandemic because again, we're so behind screens and so like physically different, you know? And so I feel like that's changed uh, my process. Um, the other thing I've, I've noticed different, uh, that's different about my poems is that um, I have much more freedom now when I write poems and I would <laughs> recommend you all do this um, to kind of like let go of any ideas to what this poem is going to turn out as and there's more voltas in other words um, the turns in a poem like mm -hmm. you're writing um, and you think the poem is done what happens, especially during the pandemic, is that I keep writing, like I don't stop. And then what happens is that the end is not the end. And there's a volta, there's a turn, it goes into a different, like almost four different possible endings. And I think the poems are actually stronger for it, because it's more honest, like, because we're in a time of uncertainty, the poem is uncertain, it doesn't even know where to go. And I actually really think that's to its benefit, because sometimes poems can feel a little too neat at the end and my mm -hmm. pandemic poems are much more mm, messy, I think. So okay. thank you for that. 
Thank you. And thank you, everybody. These are fantastic <laughs> questions. Oh my gosh. What a rich, like, oh my, speaking of like a rich broth, like this <laughs> rich broth of, of questions. Thank you, everybody, so much for your wonderful and thoughtful questions. Um, yeah, it's, I love hearing the questions that come up and where the conversation goes when, when the questions come up like this. Now, um, well, we're going to just move on to um, more of the interview part of things, if that's all right by you. Um, so, Jane, I'll just start off with this uh, first question. So you've come to us from um, Bellingham. You grew up in New Jersey where your family had their restaurant. And um, now you're wrapping up your time with your exhibit at, at Richmond in the Richmond Art Gallery. And Ginny, I just would like you to know that Ginny and I had the pleasure of going. We spent an afternoon going there to experience the exhibit in person and each component of that, which was, it was just so gorgeous and moving. So we, it was a special experience for us. Um, mm. And I just, I would love to hear just about your time um, in Richmond and yeah, if you could just let our audience members know that would be, that would be lovely. No, oh, thank you so much for that. Oh my gosh. Uh, it's been such a joy to be in Richmond. Um, the, the couple, I guess, the, I think it's been three times, um, unless my math is, I'm like the world's worst math person, um, <laughs> the times that I've, I've visited since the show has opened. Um, and I will say Richmond has the best food, like period. Um, it's just, I mean, just the fact that this, this show is about nourishment and food. And I was so utterly nourished literally every day. Mm -hmm. um, I just walk down the street and be like, mm, eat here, eat here. Um, and also knowing too, especially during the pandemic, um, how restaurants have been so deeply impacted. I mean, I think that there's something about, you know, the nourishment of a community coming together, right? And kind of during mm -hmm. these times um, and supporting each other with, with family businesses that you know, um, have, have survived luckily the, the pandemic, um, the, from start to finish, uh, it's been incredible to work with Nan, the curator at the Richmond Art Gallery. Um, it's funny because I, I usually, um, I think of myself primarily as a, as a poet, as a writer, um, and doing art in particular and installation art, um, there's something about it that, thrills me going back to this question of like what's your favorite part about being a writer mm -hmm. I think nowadays I also answer that question with like um that creative those first inklings of um the sprouts of creativity are now not just even in written word or not just on the page and now I get to kind of do that um through I think more interdisciplinary art and I think that that's been such a joy of mine that um and you know this is like I did not, I was not trained in like visual art. I was not trained in um, sculptural art or, or installation art. Um, and in many ways, like, I think that's given me a lot of freedom to just kind of play and try things out um, and that we all can do this. Like, I think there is something magical about the fact that, um, and such an honor, I think, to, to be shown at the Richmond Art Gallery that there's an element of, um, I a deep respect on my part for the power of art and, and the visual impact of it that I'm still learning. And I think that being an artist, being a writer is about still learning and still opening mm -hmm. yourself up to possibilities. Um, I absolutely loved uh, also the fact that, you know, Richmond is such a diverse um, community and um, having, you know, just some of the placards being translated in Chinese meant a lot to me. And, you know, when uh, part of the show, uh, you know, first showed uh, in Seattle at the Fry Art Gallery, uh, Fry Art Museum, like that was a very different space than the mm. Richmond Art Gallery. And the fact that it's right in a cultural center, right next to the public library, it's literally my dreams come true. I grew up in a public library myself. It was mm -hmm. right across the street from the restaurant. Um, that's how honestly I became a writer. Um, so uh, it's just been such, like it really is probably one of the biggest accomplishments of my life is to, to particularly work with the Richmond community. And just the fact that the restaurants showed up with you know uh, the bags that they're willing to donate, mm -hmm. such generosity. That's so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. We're very touched by that. Yes. And it's, it's so special to have the art gallery right next door. How often does that 
you know, does that happen in this situation with that? So it's, it's very special. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Now there's just changing tones a little bit for questions. Um, would love for you to speak more about your process for writing a poem. And you actually did, I was going to talk about beginnings and endings. And it's interesting when you were answering the question about writing during the pandemic, it sounds like it has changed, right? You, it's not so neat as you were saying anymore, that there's more room for different endings and different journeys to a poem. So I guess that's part of your process now too for writing. Yes, absolutely. And I know I'm sure there's there's many writers in the audience and everyone has a very different process and kind of um, <clears throat> also that the process can change over time, but as you know, the pandemic has, has done for me. Um, but at the, at the central core, I think that my process tends to be something that is very open-ended. Um, I will just say this, I, I'm a pretty um, ordered person in real life, like in terms of like, you know, I'm the type of person that's like someone moved uh, you know, a book or moves like a candle just a little bit over and I have to move it back. Like I'm that type of person that's like everything has its place. Um, you know, like I'm not not necessarily a messy person. Um, that said, in poetry, that it's like my place to be as messy as possible and to be as like things are not where they should be. Um, and I love that, that poetry is that kind of messy process for me. So my process kind of um, starts actually from what I call the compost pile, which goes back to food and nourishment, of course, even thinking about like growing vegetables and whatnot. Um, my mom is a huge green thumb and she's such an amazing gardener. Um, and, you know, she's, you know, grew up in a farm. Um, and actually what I do is I gather a bunch of different lines that come to my mind, have it be literally me meditating or, you know, everything just starts with random lines. And I actually have it in my notebook, but sometimes I can't get to my notebook. So I'll just write on my phone. I'm, or sometimes I'll take a picture of an image that inspired me. And I put it all in this gigantic word document called the compost. Um, and when I want to write a poem, I will absolutely at random, this is like, like, oh, I don't even know how long compost pile is, probably a hundred pages. Um, <laughs> it's big, it's massive, um, right? <laughs> it's massive. But I'll just choose like maybe five to 10 random mm -hmm. lines out of this gigantic tangle um, and I'll put it on a page and I'll just start writing through. Like I'll just start trying to connect the, the images or connect the lines. And what happens is a lot of the lines disappear um, and go back into the compost pile, but some of them stay. And what I, I, I do not like to start from a blank page. Many of you who are writers probably, it's very intimidating to start from a blank page and be like, okay, like magic, a poem's supposed to happen. But when I have random stuff I've been thinking about or even headlines I've seen or quotes, like a quote from my mom, when my mom said something, I'll write it and put it in the compost pile. Um, when I start from something, something will arise like just, you know, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. um, and whatever you're feeling through, whatever your heart is feeling through, whatever's been on your mind will show up no matter what those images are. Um, and so I trust that. Um, and it's a little messy, but I have to start that way in order for something to arise. So that's pretty much my process. Um, again, like I don't like to start from blankness. I kind of want to, I start in the garden. I start with the worms, basically the compost. Um, and then I see what can grow. Yeah. And that's what I call it. So I, I wonder if other people do this. <laughs> that is curious. And thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I find that fascinating. I know when talking to authors, you know, you, it's always so interesting to hear everyone's process, but I, I love hearing that it's not, it doesn't have to be a blank page no, that yeah. you begin with, because I, like you said, I wonder how many people listening um, do think that it has to begin with emptiness or just that you're expected to start from nothing and build from there, right? Yeah. And, you know, I keep thinking about, I always retar return to Audre Lorde in particular and, you know, uh, her essay, Poetry is Not a Luxury. She talks about how poetry is carved from our daily lived experiences. Um, and so, so much of writing 
is just your daily life. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, making sure to kind of gather those pieces, to record them, to, to write down the lines, um, and how to weave those in, how to carve them into something else. Um, so I take a lot of inspiration from that, that I don't need to seek inspiration. Like I'm not trying to go out and find inspiration. Inspiration's already here, right? Um, it's in the tiniest thing. Like when you see a little ant crawl across the room, like that could be inspiration. You just have to look. Um, and just, uh, I guess being a poet, it's kind of like you're a collector. You're just gathering the stuff of the lived experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's central too to my process is that I don't try to look for inspiration. Um, it already is within me. And I think for all of you too, to kind of trust trust what's already in you and around you versus going off and, you know, this idea of like, oh, I need to go off somewhere to kind mm -hmm. of find something, but no, it's already there. Um, and I think that that's kind of beautiful too. It is. And that's a related, uh, just following that line of thought, going into another question, there was a TED talk that I had listened to of one of your TED talks. And you, t you spoke about how writing is not learned um, mm -hmm. school, right? Um, and you mentioned about, you don't have to go out to be inspired. You don't have to look for those things. And you had spoken about how you learned while growing up in your family's restaurant. Like that's where you had the most of your learning, right? Yes. And and I just wonder when, you, when you're when you teaching, um, how do you transfer or how do you share those lessons? Um, or what are some of the key lessons that you would want to teach, you know, aspiring poets or even your students who are looking looking for that? Oh, thank you so much for that, Michelle. And also thank you for watching that, that TED talk. Um, I really do firmly believe that I became a writer um, for two reasons, which is I grew up in a restaurant and restaurant life um, is just pure sensory overload. Like it is smell, taste, everything. Uh, customers have stories. Like oh it's, it's <laughs> like a writer's paradise, to, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and then I grew up across the street from, uh, at, at the restaurant across the public library. And so I just, my mom, left me there for like five hours, six hours. And I just read all the time. Um, so those two pairings really led me to kind of um, this path. And this was a path again, um, I, you know, grow up working class and I didn't, you know, even thinking about the pressure to, to be a doctor, to be a lawyer or something, especially I feel like immigrant children feel that pressure. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I could have, there was, but I felt like this, I had no choice. Like, it was like a weird, like calling, like, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. um, it had to do with my upbringing. Um, but back to your question and thinking about kind of um, craft and thinking about kind of what I try to, to kind of share with my students and, and to share with all of you and thinking about like um, growing up in a restaurant is all those sensory details. Um, writing centers itself around how we feel through the world. And I, I, I talked about this actually when I was teaching uh, today was that the felt experience is central. Um, you want as a reader to feel and the writer is you know, trying to get across that feeling. And that's so hard to do, right? And thinking mm -hmm. about the ways in which language, there is a limit to what language can do actually. Um, for instance, like when you're going through something like a heart heartbreak like kind of like a breakup and you're like crying profusely sometimes there's no words like there is just literally it's only that gut sound mm -hmm. like a sound um but after a while right you can try to get closer mm -hmm. to how that felt um what the what the temperature felt in that like in that room mm -hmm. um what did you just eat right before that breakup happens like thinking about all the senses right were you cold were you um <laughs> like you know hearing the sounds of a mower outside while that was happening um so i'm very into like tapping into the senses and also synesthesia so that the mixing of senses is central too and i try to do that as much as i can in my writing to think about the ways images have that kind of quality to them um i was even thinking <laughs> There's this one poem, um, what is love if not rot? Um, and there's uh, this kind of moment here where I'm trying to describe uh, a rotting orange. Mm -hmm. And if you just watch uh, YouTube videos of rotting um, vegetables, they're magical. They're 
kind of a little disgusting, but also <laughs> very beautiful. Um, and so I like to give myself exercises to try to describe something almost kind of like through a kaleidoscopic lens. So you have to look at it from all different angles. Mm -hmm. um, and so here's a line, which is, you know, it's thickening at 22 days, like cotton lint from the dryer, like fur, a sheepskin cloud, like my mother, an animal in her own right. And then later um, it grows smaller and smaller, collapsing upon itself like curled fists, how I sleep at night, um, returning to heartbreak after heartbreak, fruit flies fluttering about like snow. So like images like that, like I wanted to hear you to hear the fruit flies, the sound of them, but also want to feel that the kind of that you see the image of the, the when fruit flies are buzzing so fast, it maybe looks like it's snowing, uh, but also the cold and the color. So all these sensory details, I try to do it myself, but I feel like I really want to impart that as such a, for me, that's the joy of writing is like trying to get uh, that felt experience across and knowing you can't get it exactly right because you, there's no way to get back to that moment mm -hmm. uh, exactly 100%, but you can get 99% close <laughs> to it. That. Yeah. And thank you for sharing. I love that, that poem. And I didn't get the chance to look at the videos. <laughs> oh. I was like, because after I read it, I'm like, you know what? I feel that. Like, yeah. it, you know, the sounds, the yeah. sound, the feeling, the smell, just all of that. And I love that one of the words I had thought about was visceral. Like you can just feel so much yeah. from your poetry. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And that was, yeah. So that was just fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, now I'm just con <laughs> conscious of time here. Oh. Um, so I did want to ask, uh, talk about your plans if it's okay to talk about for your upcoming memoir yes thank you yes. so much for that michelle um you know i'm terrified uh <laughs> i am a poet i primarily write uh in verse and um i love imagery and metaphors um i will say writing nonfiction is a, such a challenge and a beautiful challenge but I do really have to uh, think about narrative and think about reflecting. Um, so my memoir uh, is in progress right now. It's called Meet Me Tonight in Atlantic City. It's uh, slated for 2023. So that's like next year. That is next um, year. <laughs> it's next year. I know. And my editor is just like, kind of pushing me, but I'm just like, oh my gosh, like I'm on book tour and um, teaching and all these things. And, um, but I will say that this memoir is super close to my heart. I actually started writing this book um, around 2017 or so. Um, okay. So it's been a while. Um, mm -hmm. It was not a memoir. It was uh, essays, just singular essays. Mm -hmm. um, and why I started writing essays in particular is that at some point a poem, it does get a feeling across it does try to articulate, um, I guess, what my heart and my head is trying to say. However, it doesn't actually um, allow a lot of space, um, I think, for some deep, deep digging. Um, and so I needed like, you know, 20 pages. I needed something quite long. Mm -hmm. And I love long poems, um, of course, too, but I needed something else. And so I started writing essays. For instance, um, uh, the title essay of the memoir, Meet Me Tonight in Atlantic City, um, as I mentioned, my father um, was a gambler um, and he spent all his time at Atlantic City. Um, and, you know, that's really hard for a child <clears throat> to grow up that way. Um, and I was thinking to myself, like, I, I can't be the only one, right? Because I, I kept thinking, why do all these, um, you know, buses keep picking up from Chinatowns, you know, in New York and, you know, in, in New Jersey, like even thinking about like, uh, targeting immigrant communities in particular, mm -hmm. um, and Chinese communities. And so I did a lot of social, like sociology, just kind of looking at a different way of understanding a lot of the things that had been on my mind. Um, and uh, started writing this essay, really thinking about Atlantic City and its history as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so essays and memoir writing has been like a mixture of like personal uh, memories and essays, but also a lot of research and a lot of 
trying to understand what it means to grow up, um, you know, as the child of Chinese immigrants mm -hmm. in the States, right, at kind of like the 80s, 90s, yeah. uh, and their kind of history before that. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the, the essays kind of um, are now going to be kind of intermingled into a memoir. Um, and I hope my biggest goal for this book is that even though, yes, at times it is a little heartbreaking. I mean, you know, the restaurant failed. It's like, you know, my father's not in my life. There are some painful parts to the to the kind of book. Um, that said, I hope it's funny. Like that's my whole, oh, <laughs> I really do because it's a funny, there's like a jokey side of myself that I think does not come out in my poetry that totally comes out in my prose for some reason. Um, speaking about, you know, why our process changes, I, I don't know why, um, but, you know, there's an essay in that book too uh, called Root Canal Street. And if anyone knows New York City's Chinatown, there's Canal Street is like the big strip that's, uh, you know, running through, uh, you know, New York City's Chinatown, but it's about illegal dentists. So Root Canal, it's supposed to be silly. It's supposed yeah. to be kind of like a joke, um, but also like, oh yeah, I did grow up without insurance. And my mom did go to unlicensed uh, illegal, you know, dentists in Chinatown. Um, and so trying to find the grandma that was going to lead us to the dentist, like some random grandma um, in Chinatown. It's ridiculous. It's, I think it's funny trying to find her. Um, you know, like, does she give us a wink? Like, you know, so I really think, I really hope that the memoir, as much as, as it is kind of full of heart um, and heartache, that it's funny. Uh, that's what I will say about the memoir. I just really, I hope you just at least smile a little bit, or at least are like, that's ridiculous. Um, so, you know, it's meant for, uh, I guess, little weird, little weird Chinese American kids, I guess, kind of like me, like I always wanted to write something to push back against the model minority myth and, and mm -hmm. push back against these stereotypes, because I was a very strange, weird, non-conforming child. <laughs> Do you think you at any point would like to branch off into writing for or exploring different uh, writing picture books or, oh my gosh, you know, because there's a possibility thinking about yourself as a child and where that might, where that might go in terms of stories. I have always wanted to write a children's book actually. So that's oh, really, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just need to find the illustrator, the perfect illustrator to work with. Um, that's totally a dream of mine. Um, but I don't think I can do fiction. That's like, I know that's still, I mean, maybe, maybe the, this, maybe through a children's book that could be a little bit like more comfortable fiction wise, but I could never write a novel. Watch me say this and then like- And then you'll have a novel. A whole yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> but I, I really, really admire novelists. Kudos to you all. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. Like, I have no idea how I'm in such awe of novelists. I really am because I can get sucked in, you all can get sucked into a novel, right? In the world, but I don't know how to do that. So, kudos to, to novelists. Well, okay. that's wonderful to hear that you are thinking about that, though. You oh, know, I love to explore. And, and I, I wish we could keep talking <laughs> for so long. And we've just, we're coming to the very end. And I just can't thank you enough for the, for have, you know, for giving us the chance to speak with you and to, to hear more and for answering everybody's wonderful questions. And um, we just can't wait to see what you do next and read more of your work. So thank you so, so much, Michelle. And yes, thank you everybody for your incredible questions and just like your generosity of curiosity. I feel like that's like ultimately at the central core of what it means to be um, a writer and artist. And again, it's just an honor to, to work with the Richmond Art Gallery and the Richmond Public Library to, um, you know, if I could, if I could move tomorrow, I'd move. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm actually serious. Like I, loved it. it how do I describe it it's like when I went it's like I, I felt comfortable um and I think it's in parts looking around seeing people who look like me and I mm. I don't really have that in Bellingham and so mm. just thank you Richmond for just being awesome like I just it just made me feel so at home um in many ways so um it's just an honor so thank you everyone so so much Thank you. I'll, I'll just quickly turn over um, back to my lovely colleague, Ginny, for just a bit of closing. And thank you again, Jane. It was such, such a pleasure. Thank you.
Oh, I wish we had so much more time. Thank you so much, Jane and Michelle. That was that was fabulous. That was absolutely amazing. And thank you as well to our audience members for their attention and their wonderful questions. If anyone has not yet explored the Nourish exhibition, it is on display at the Richmond Art Gallery until April 3rd. And we very much encourage everyone to attend. Um, thank you to the Richmond Art Gallery Association and Richmond Has Heart for your support in making today's event possible. And finally, the library has Jane's book, How to Not Be Afraid of Everything on Order. And you are more than welcome to place it on hold. We have put the link and the chat box at the bottom of the screen. And if you would like to access the recording of today's event, it will be available through the Richmond Art Gallery's YouTube channel. So thank you so much again, everyone. We have come to the end of today's event. Please enjoy your evening. Thank you.